Imagine owning a property like that with a view like that. Remember one of the first impressions I had, my God, he's like 100 miles an hour, and I thought, is, is he on some kind of upper? He got around in his Rolls Royce or his hot rod. And he made a lot of friends and he made a lot of enemies. Kids growing up in Redford, we weren't used to people coming in and saying, come down and paint my place and I'll pay you. Fame, but that's the main goal, fame. They're not artists, they're criminals in the making. British expats designer drugs and acid house. Go back 40 years to the late 80s and you might be surprised to hear that Sydney was once known as the dance capital of the world. While many young DJs were behind the movement, an heir to a million dollar meat market, Tony Spanos created the Graffiti Hall of Fame. But in the early 2000s, after being hit with multiple court cases that led Tony into bankruptcy, the Graffiti Hall of Fame was shut down. With Sydney now known as a ghost town for nightlife, we wanted to explore its legacy. Hello. Julie. Hi, Tony. Hey. Nice there to you go. You. Pleased to meet you. I'm Tony Spanos. I describe myself right as a uh, five foot three Greek kangaroo. Well, I grew up in Vaucluse, which is an ex a pretty expensive area back in the day and still is. Grew up in the meat business and I always wanted to be a race car driver. I was, I took off to America for a few thousand dollars and with my mouth took my way into the steering wheel of a NASCAR. He'll be one of the world's greatest race drivers and coming from Australia. Thank you for I wanted to show up a little bit, but I wanted to bring the car home. You know? I came back thinking, I want to help all the kids in Redfern because I was disappointed in seeing them on the gutters. He had a lot of contacts, you know, because of where he, he came from. Tony had all these connections with all these all these big names, yeah. Sydney was uh, quite a bit of a wild playground, remembering there was you know, no mobile phones, there was no internet, there was no police cameras. It, it was just a, a meatworks, yeah. an amazing canvas for guys like me to mm. paint. We spread like viral around the schools and the kids and they were just turning up by the drones. The first rave there was 1991, mm -hmm. so everyone could go and just enjoy the music, enjoy the vibe and, and enjoy the spirit. Every 40 had 100 friends. This was kind of like the first place where everyone was kind of included. It was mind blowing, it was like a cathedral of artwork. First off, like, you know, you see all the graffiti on there, then you see the old combi vans or the old um, bug punch buggies there. Preparation would start it seven in the afternoon. It's like coming to the gym to do your exercise dance in the morning with the sun coming up. Those parties were pretty mad, you know, like we couldn't believe that we could get away with it. They were pouring lighter fluid all down the walls and there was like flames coming down. Everyone was freaking out, like they couldn't believe like, you know, that Tone owned it, like you owned that building. I never knew any of their real names. I don't know where they lived. Underground Resistance actually played there. It gave kids like myself a little bit of an outlet to kind of escape from that, like, harsh realities. There, there weren't many opportunities when you grew up in, in Redford. And most of the kids had turned up. They'd already been through the ringer of life. They'd been damaged. I couldn't damage them anymore. I'm seeing everything I own, my ferries, my cars, my properties, all going in front of my eyes by being generous to the young people on the street, disadvantaged children and troubled youth. It's not always easy to tell with Tony which stories are true and which ones might be slightly exaggerated. Yeah, well, the movie, the movie Days of Thunder was 99% me and my girlfriend Sandy, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman saw me as some sort of rival that I might make fame before the release of the movie. And that was the end of my career, so I came back. At one point, he says the movie Yes Man was probably made about his life. But one thing we do know about Tony for sure is that his money and influence in the local community helped a lot of underserved kids. Yeah, Graffiti Hall of Fame was um, diverse in every possible way. And with the local First Nation kids from the block, they were really important to me. Bibi, it's home time. Hey, champion. <laughs> hey, you're looking younger for a grandma. Marvina and her family met Tony when she was just a kid. Tony would go on to sponsor her brother's rugby teams, try and organize trips for an all-star team to the US, and in general, hand out the cash in his pockets to anyone that asked. And the wider community didn't didn't like him because he was supporting you know, the local people, not only Aboriginal people, but all nationalities, you know. His family disowned him for it, you know. I think she was pretty young. I don't know, he came to Graffiti Hall of Fame once and sat outside when some boys were doing graffiti yeah, on the wall. Yeah. I, got, I got cranky because it wasn't our I think I was about 10. 10 or 10 or yeah, something. Yeah, the boys yeah. 9 and David would have been That's right. something like that. So. While the Graffiti Hall of Fame was a safe haven for the partiers, the graffers, the local kids, Tony was often in trouble with the police and the local council. They'd come knocking at his door, looking to shut the parties down, and soon he was taken to court. Kids, I thought they were maybe going to bump me off. You know? <laughs> bump you off? Like, bump me off, yeah. They kill you? Yeah. 
you know, such a, a nuisance. I think the police had come a few times and negotiations had broken down. They just wanted to come in and just stop it. So they, the police gathered en masse. They shut the whole of Botany Road. Their plan was to get everyone in the rave out on the street, just clear the flush the place out. So they came in, they fought their way through the crowd with torches and they went upstairs. They shut the top sound system down. No music, but people weren't moving. They just stayed there. And I put a chain around and locked them out because they didn't have a, a warrant. True. So they used a bolt cutter to get in without a warrant. And I put them onto citizen's arrest because they're pulling out wiring out of the sound systems illegally. They grabbed me in a headlock and took me to jail. There was one issue ever, and it was a, a kid that parents were drug dealers from Parramatta or somewhere, on the run. He escaped from the police that day, had a gun. He found that there was a party on at our place that night. Yeah, some guy climbed over a fence and got shot in the butt. This place is harassed us, even when we were there, we've seen it all ourselves, you know? Mm. And he wasn't doing nothing. Mm. We are just there trying to keep everyone safe keep them off the streets. Like they were trying to shut it down and Tony just kept trying and until the final appeal in the Supreme Court. He was being pushed out by politics. He lost the appeal and the Graffiti Hall of Fame was over. You know, people saw that as a commercial opportunity, not only in, in the property value, but as in the actual parties as a commercial business. So it became a whole new mm. era. It was sad because he put his, so much his heart and soul into the place. And then to have it shut down, you know, all he did was try and bring good times and joy and, and helping people get a foot up in the industry. And I said, okay, you know, as much as I love Tony Spanos, you know, I kind of disconnected and I just followed the music. So we went bush. So it was getting to the point where I was losing everything over the parties and the kids and the graffiti and the environmental activism. And it was a race. Who's going to get the rest of my money? The judges and the courts and the lawyers or the kids? Tony tells us these days that he's lost almost all his money to the Graffiti Hall of Fame. Even today, he's still embroiled in a court case around his boat shed that sits on Sydney Harbour. It cost me 20 years of my life and 8 million bucks. Despite that, he's still optimistic about the future. We decided to take Tony back to where it all started. I haven't been back here again. I don't like that. Uh, we'd be in the Graffiti Hall of Fame right yeah, now. Yeah, we'd be in it now. See, there's the wall. There is one there, look. Oh, There it is. We'd be there. over here dancing. That wall was graffiti all the way along, all the way around. The some still there The ground well. was painted. That's Demote painted that one over there. This one here, Fractured Woman, with a bullet through it. 1990. Mm. 30 years. 33 years. This is this it. This was a dance floor? That was huge. This is where we used to dance. It's kind of hypocritical that they kept it after... All those years. Ten, yeah. You think they would have rolled it out when they painted it? They were so oh. probably stingy when they built it with a grey paint, they didn't roll it out. I'm really happy to see that they left it. You know, it's really funny. It's actually hilarious that they left it. <laughs>